Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Facebook Live, uh, Claim Machine Live, rather. I am Jeff Palmer, the founder and CEO of Clean Machine. Today, we're going to be talking about branch chain amino acids. Um, now, when I uh, posted this, um, most of it was going to focus on brand new research that's coming out showing how important branch chain amino acids are, especially as we age. The latest research is actually showing that um, leucine, one of the three branch chain amino acids, may actually even be more important than protein intake. Now, this is pretty extraordinary because most of the studies have shown as we age, we actually do need higher amounts of protein uh, to compensate for muscle loss. It's called sarcopenia or age-related muscle loss. We don't want muscle loss as we age because then that weakens us. And as we are weakened, we can fall or collapse or knock our head or break bones. And in nursing homes, actually broken hips or fractured hips is one of the leading causes of hospitalizations and even death. So this is really important to maintain our strength and muscle levels all through our life so that we don't end up being frail having accidents and then dying at a uh, premature age. So this is why this is so important to me because I want to talk about how br branch chains can be health promoting and beneficial. Now, when I posted this, originally I had some feedback of uh, people who have been listening to one of the most popular plant-based doctors out there. I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. Uh, who is very anti-supplement. Uh, it seems like he takes every every opportunity he can to bash the supplement industry um, or talk down about supplements in general um, and, and making claims that just basically are not true and generalizations that are just basically um, not fair or true either. Um, but it's okay. You know, I think there's a place for that and it's, it's in the conversation, but he, he uh, posted a article called are branch chains healthy question mark Ooh, that sounds like branch chains are dangerous for us and he and he uh, went on to uh suggest suggest not show show no proof actually in the entire video but suggest that branch chains may have a negative impact on insulin and and so what he proceeded to do was show that um, those consuming a higher animal-based diet had insulin resistance but of course, <laughs> higher animal-based diet is higher in fat. Uh, fat is known to cause insulin resistance. So let me explain how this works. So you have the cell here, and the cell has its metabolism, right? It needs calories. Insulin comes over, docks to the outsides of the cell. The cell opens up and pulls in calories, like in pulling calories in the form of uh, sugars, carbohydrates, fats or proteins, which we can use specifically even branch chains for energy. Now, fat actually has about two, a little less than two and a half times the amount of calories than uh, protein or carbohydrates, even sugars do. So fat, if you're eating a high fat animal diet, uh, what happens is the fat uh, globules actually start to gum up the inside of the cell and the cell has too much energy in it. So it shuts down the receptor sites on the outside of the cell and that says insulin go away. I can't allow any more energy in the cell. We have enough energy here. Now, what that does is shut down the receptor site on the outside of the cell. Now, insulin can't do anything. Now, if you continue to eat fats and sugars, these sugars then can sit in the you know, bloodstream and say, oh, I can't get into the cell. If you're not exercising, you're not using up those calories. So those calories are just sitting and gumming up the cell. And now that sugar can't get into the cell where it belongs to feed muscle tissue. So that sugar then breaks down into what we call AGEs, nasty metabolites that can cause damage to the eyes, to the legs, to the limbs, the cardiovascular system, all kinds of states. But this is a disease of fat. Fat causes uh, diet type 2 diabetes, not sugar. Sugar comes along and when it can't get in because of the fat causing the insulin resistance, the sugar can cause negative effects too, but the sugar wouldn't cause those negative effects if you weren't consuming too much fat and or exercising and burning up those calories and utilizing those calories. Now, what 
what Dr. Greger tried to do was associate a high animal protein diet with insulin resistance, which is absolutely true, but he's trying to blame it on the branch chain amino acids here. So what he did was found this study, and I'll, I'll read it out to you because it sounds pretty bad. It says decreased consumption of branch chain amino acids improves metabolic health. Now, what's, what's really strange about the choice of that study is the study didn't control for branch chain amino acids at all. It controlled for animal food intake, which is high protein. <laughs> so I'm like, are you kidding me? It didn't. Well, yes, of course, by reducing total animal food intake, you're going to reduce the branch chain amino acid intake. But that's just by default. What you've done, what we know causes uh, diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes specifically, is fat. And, and Dr. Dr. Greger has, has actually done a, a great study. I'll go ahead and post that in the comments section. Let me get that up there. Go to the comments and post Dr. Greger's own uh, study here. And uh, it shows that type 2 diabetes, and I'll put the, the study right here. I'll pull, pull it up on the screen too so everyone can see it. Um, so this is uh, the link. You can link it right to uh, Dr. Greger's, but you can just type in um, fat and diabetes in nutritionfacts.org. And you'll see that he says very clearly <laughs> that fat is the cause of type 2 diabetes. Well, then he goes and posts a study that is really erroneously titled branch chains are the cause of this when they didn't control for branch chains at all. They didn't just reduce the amount of branch chains, they reduced the amount of animal proteins, which guess what animal proteins have? Fat. <laughs> Does fat reduce uh, metabolic health? A hundred percent. He even says that in his own video, that fat is the cause of type 2 diabetes. So why would you get this study with a title that misleads people intentionally, yet show no proof of actual branch chains causing insulin resistance? I'm actually going to show you the real proof, but it doesn't. <laughs> so let's put up the very first study. Um, so where did this misnomer come from? So just like the sugar thing, I used to think sugar causes diabetes. It does not. Fat causes diabetes. Sugar just comes along because fat has already caused insulin resistance, can't get into the cell, and then the sugar then causes the damage. But the sugar is not responsible for the insulin resistance. It's the fat inside the cell. You remove the fat. A great study, really long time ago. A guy took a bunch of people who were type 2 diabetes. He put them on white rice and white sugar, right? Highest glycemic value possible of any foods. He put them on just that, but removed fat from their diet, and they reversed their type 2 diabetes on white sugar and <laughs> white rice. Now, I'm not suggesting anybody do that. It's the idea behind it was that they weren't contributing to it. It was clearly the fat because they reduced the fat from the diet. Why show a study that when you're only controlling for animal food, which contains high amounts of saturated fats, when you control for that, of course, it's already well known and established that fat causes type 2 diabetes, not sugar. The, on the same context, what we look as an associative comparison. So what they were looking at is, okay, if we look at people with type 2 diabetes already in their diabetic state, and they see a higher level of branch chains in their bloodstream, that they assumed, oh, branch chains are causing the type 2 diabetes. Eh. Just like sugar does not cause diabetes, fat does, but it can be a symptom of it. This is the exact same thing we're seeing with uh, branch chain amino acids. Now, the studies that they did on branch chain amino acids, these are branch chains from our normal diet. But what's actually finding out that it's the branch chains that are being broken down from protein catabolism. 
So our body goes through what's called protein turnover. It constantly breaks down proteins and recycles them and repurposes them. And as they break down these proteins, the branch chains are released into our bloodstream. Now, what happens if the blood is, can't get rid of those branch chain amino acids? The branch chains pile up. And that's what they're seeing with type 2 diabetes is that their body is not good at clearing out the branch chains from this protein turnover. This is a natural healthy process. The dysfunction is the type 2 diabetes that's causing the branch chains to elevate in the bloodstream, not the other way around. It's not the BCAs causing the, the type 2 diabetes, it's the type 2 diabetes causing elevated blood levels of BCAs. The people that they found had higher levels of BCAs were type 2 diabetes. They weren't taking any supplemental BCAs. Their BCA blood levels rose because they weren't getting it out of their system fast enough. That's the problem, the clearance of the BCAs caused by the type 2 diabetes. Now, let's, let's take a look at this next study. All right, I'm going to put this one up on the screen. And I'll put this up so that you can see both the title of the study. Okay, so the study, as it says right in front of you, branch chain amino acid metabolism, insulin sensitivity and liver fat response to exercise training in sedentary people who are dysglycemic, which means they have too much glycemic or blood sugar levels and normal glycemic or normal levels of blood sugar. So the conclusion and the interpretation of their study, their findings, plasma BCA concentration was largely unresponsive to long-term exercise. That means BCAs in the blood had nothing to do with insulin response. Zero effect on it. <laughs> I'm like, this is what's actually showing it. It's showing that when you exercise and take BCAs, it has no effect on plasma blood levels because the exercise is helping your body clear out that excess. It's only in sedentary, overweight people with diabetes that are having dysfunction of BCA clearance. Do you see how these associative degrees, uh, uh, um, excuse me, um, <laughs> uh, these associative studies are, are just making an association. Um, so let me, get, uh, let me get this cleared. So it's just associative. It's, it's, it's assuming that, oh, there's higher BCAs, oh, in diabetes, that must be a cause. No, it's a symptom of that. So what you want to do is increase your exercise. So let's take a look at the next study. And here we go. And this one study is looked at exactly increasing supplemental BCAAs. Paste that here and put it up on the screen for you. So this next study, they took athletes and actually gave them supplemental BCAAs, and this is what they found. So they found, and this is directly quote from the study. This is the title of the study, the effects of BCAAs on insulin resistance in athletes. And they quote, Branch chain amino acids as a common nutritional supplement for athletes do not induce insulin resistance. Let's read that again because there are plant based doctors out there trying to make this association just because they hate on the, the supplement industry. And it's just not true. The science shows why this is not true. Um, and they even go into the expo possible explanation for this is the phenomenon that exercise can enhance mitochondrial oxidative uh, um, potential. Um, so the body is actually churning because you're increasing the metabolic response of the cells. It's burning up more energy. It's using the fat in the cells. This is why exercise improves insulin um, sensitivity. So your body is actually more sensitive 
even when using the branch chain amino acids. So this myth that somehow branch chains are actually uh, decreasing insulin sensitivity is just not borne out in the research at all. Um, and, and it's kind of sad that there are plant-based doctors out there using associative or epidemiological. So what is an associative corollary study? It's saying that, okay, everyone that wears a red, there are 10 people that wear red hats out of 100. Out of, out of those uh, 100 people, more people died of cancer than red hat, wearing red hats. Therefore, there's a clear association that wearing a red hat can cause cancer. Now, we know that's stupid, right? That's what an associative or corollary study does, or epidemiological is looking at a lot of people and saying, oh, there's a probability. Those probability studies are good. They're necessary for us to take it further and look at the actual causes inside the body. What is actually metabolically going on inside the body? But if you just associate sugar with diabetes as the cause because there's higher amount of blood sugar when you have type 2 diabetes because you've shut down the insulin visit, um response, the body's ability to put that sugar where it belongs into the muscle cells so you can grow, so it can feed you and give you energy. It's not the sugar that's the cause, and it's not the branch chains the cause. The sugar and the branch chains accumulate in the bloodstream because your body is not exercising. So if you're not exercising, don't take additional protein, don't take additional amino acids, and start exercising. Now, when you're exercising, you're going to need more calories, you're going to need more protein, and you're going to need more branch chains. This is what I really wanted to get to, to show that as our body ages, we actually need more and more protein and more and more. And the study after study after study after study is being shown this very clearly. What's cool about these new studies, and I'm going to put them up one at a time for you, but these new studies are showing that you can actually just consume the branch chains or the leucine by itself without consuming all that extra protein without all that extra calories, without all that extra attached fats that you would get from animal products. So this can help you in multiple ways. Now, I'm going to say, I'm going to show you why it's important. Uh, if you're trying to gain some muscle for overall physical fitness and health, remember, the more muscle you have on your body, the higher metabolism you have. This means you're turning over calories, means you will store less body fat, means you'll actually be healthier inside as well, less trunk fat, fat in the organs, around your heart, around your liver, in your brain, where they can cause serious health problems. So what you want to do is maintain a little bit or, or maintain a good amount of muscle on your body, even as you get into the ages like me, I'm going to be 59 in two months. That's amazing that I'll be entering my 60th year of life and in the best shape of my life. And because I've been giving my body what it's nutritionally required. And now the research is actually showing us that this requirement could be even more potentially life-saving because it helps maintain strength and muscle. So it reduces fat, reduces metabolic syndrome, reduces the risk of diabetes when you exercise and give it the proper nutrition, including branch chain amino acids. This is really important. And why, why it really pains me to see People just with their bias trying to knock down supplementation. There is a place for supplementation. I tell everybody whole foods first. That is where you should get your nutrition from predominantly. But supplementation can help. And I'm going to show you why in just a second. I'm going to pull up this next image. Okay. So this image shows you the amino acid profiles of different plants as well as uh, whey protein in this context. Now, whey protein is even higher than, than uh, sometimes uh, meat and, and eggs and other things like this, but they're higher in leucine. And, and that's for the reason for the calf to grow from 60 pounds to 600 pounds, right? Leucine helps our muscles grow, and that's established and known. Uh, but how much leucine? That's the important part. Well, this is an interesting study because it was looking at both rice, soy, and whey and comparing them. What they found was what's called, what we now call in, in the scientific community, the leucine threshold. The leucine threshold is the amount of leucine it takes 
to maximally stimulate muscle growth to a healthy level. Okay, so if you look at where you see suboptimal, you see that arrow pointing to suboptimal. This is the rice and whey pro rice and soy protein is suboptimal. Now, to get to that, you have to just consume more soy and rice. So that was at 25 grams. Now, if you look down on the right hand side of the chart, you see 48 grams of rice and 50 grams of soy. And then if you look on the bar graph all the way to the right, you'll see that. Now rice and soy are optimally stimulating muscle growth by reaching the leucine threshold. That is you getting enough of leucine from just a higher consumption of these plant-based proteins. So you have two options here, which is really great. One, you can simply eat more plant proteins to get you into that threshold so that you maximally stimulate muscle growth. Now, remember, because of this research is coming out showing that as we age, that threshold is inching up a little bit, a little bit, and, and possibly because of our body's inability to metabolize proteins well, lots of different things that are going on there. But we need to consume a little bit higher protein or leucine. Now, as we age, our body metabolism slows down naturally, generally. That's not true with everyone, but generally. So when your body metabolism slows down, you need to reduce your caloric intake so that you maintain a healthy body weight. Well, if your body is telling you you have to increase the plant proteins and more calories in order to get that, that may not be optimal for where you want to be at at weight, where you want to be at at met metabolic health. But if we can just increase the leucine all by itself, you're not adding any calories. You're not adding all that extra stuff that comes from the added protein. And as we age, we need less calories. This is a beautiful way to get that leucine threshold in there so you maintain the strength and muscle size, keep your metabolic health going, but reduce your caloric intake. Now we know that caloric reduction increases lifespan. So you can actually help your body by reducing your calories, but keeping your leucine intake at a level that is healthy for you so that you maintain your muscle and strength through the rest of your life. This is why supplementation can be at an advantage. Is it impossible to do on a whole food plant-based site? No, absolutely not. Nothing is really if you put enough effort into it. But is it easier for the vast majority of people, especially elderly or especially people who are 40 plus of age? 100%. Yes, it can be easier. Yes, it can be healthy. Check out my video on BCAs and immune health. If you haven't seen it already, especially immune health being so important in this time of, of viruses, you can see how the body actually uses branch chains to help the immune system actually fend off and defeat viruses. So this is another beautiful example. So let me, let me get into the actual studies that I really was starting out with, which is amazing. So this first study is um, talking about, it's not just uh, men or women, uh, men, excuse me, it's women too. And what's also cool is it's not just protein. You can actually just increase the leucine and get the health benefits with out having to add the extra protein. Uh, this can mean lower calories, of course. I'm gonna put it up on the screen for you. So this study says leucine, not total protein content of a supplement, is the primary determinant of muscle protein anabolic responses in healthy older women. So this was actually done in women showing, yes, that just increasing the leucine, not your protein, you didn't have to increase protein at all. And it improved your overall muscle, your muscle health, your strength health. And remember, muscle burns fat, just two and a half pounds of muscle on your body distributed all over your body. So just a few ounces everywhere, two and a half pounds of fat, two and a half pounds of muscle on your body will burn a pound of fat every single month. Now, how is that good for your body? That is why when you lose 
weight and you drop down muscle, but you gain the body fat back, now you're actually burning less calories because you have less muscle burning those calories. Muscle burns calories even at rest. And so muscle is calorie intensive. This is a great thing. That way, as you age and you have to reduce your caloric intake, if you have a little bit more muscle, you can enjoy food more without gaining as much weight because your body has more muscle, which is burning off those calories. This is a wonderful study showing that leucine, not just protein, uh, especially in women, but also in men too. How about this study? Let me get this one posted in there, comment section. I love these studies. <laughs> and, and they're studies that empower you to make the best decisions for your life. You know, that's what I'm trying to share is give you stuff that give you information about the real research, what it's saying, so that you can make the best decisions to have the best outcomes in your life. So you can enjoy life. As, as healthy and, and a long lasting, not just lifespan, but health span. That's living a healthy long life, not just a long life. Because living a long life as sick with full of disease days is no fun at all. I don't want to do that. That's torture. That's hell. That's not, that's not beneficial. So this study is, is really cool. It says daily leucine intake is positively associated with lower limb skeletal mass and strength in the elderly. So it says in conclusion, we demonstrated that total daily leucine intake was associated with muscle mass and strength in healthy older individuals. This is really important because we're looking at healthy individuals, not obese, not uh, sedentary, not those on the standard American diet eating a bunch of crap and garbage. This is actually looking at healthy and it still influenced them, just the leucine alone, which is a branch chain amino acid. So the next study, um, we're gonna talk about is the dietary leucine requirements of older men and women is higher than current recommendations. So this one even talks uh, about what are the current recommendations and are they wrong? And that's pretty interesting because, you know, when science says, hey, wait a minute, I think we got this leucine thing all wrong, that we should actually be consuming more leucine, not less. All right, let's, let's go ahead and put that up. Uh, okay, here we go. All right, the dietary leucine requirement uh, in, in older people. So um, in this study, the researchers estimated that the leucine requirement for older adults is more than double that of young people. So if we were trying to do that just in food, we would have to double our food intake, double our protein intake. That's probably not a good idea. <laughs> but what we can do is just double our leucine intake without having to add all that extra food because as we age we actually need less calories not more but as we age we actually need more leucine not less so the way we can accomplish this without gaining weight without over consuming calories which is known to actually lower our lifespan is by actually just consuming the leucine alone Okay. And the last one I want to talk about is, um, is one more reference to uh, why the body changes when we exercise and why looking at overweight, obese people with type two diabetes is probably not the best response. Because as you become overweight, your metabolism changes. As you change to a plant-based diet, your microbiome changes. The metabolites in your body change. The, the systems change. The amount of polyphenols change. The amount of fiber changes. All these changes happen. So I wanna, I wanna show you something when we're comparing high-protein diets. So this study actually looked at two sets of high-protein diets those eating high animal proteins and those eating high plant proteins. Okay, so the branch chain or the protein, the protein amount was identical, same amount of high protein, but the results were dramatically different. 
I'm going to post this one right now in the chat box, but I also put it up on the screen because this one really kind of sums it up nicely. So this one is the low protein intake is associated with a major reduction in IGF-1 cancer, overall mortality. Now this part is interesting in the title of the study. In the 65 and younger, but not the older population. Okay, so what did it show? <laughs> All right. So what it showed was a five, those in the animal protein, let me pull this down so you can see me <laughs> while I'm talking. Those in the animal protein group, remember the exact same number of grams of protein, like 200 grams of protein, 200 grams of plant protein, 200 animal, same grams of protein. So it's not the amount of protein, it's the type of protein. Those in the animal-based diet had a 400% increase in cancer. Those in the animal-based protein diet had a 500% increase in diabetes, 500% increase in diabetes, right? But what it showed in the bottom, and I am going to post it up because this singularly is so important. The study said, and I'll quote, these associations were either abolished or attenuated if the proteins were plant derived. Same amount of high protein, no cancer, <laughs> no diabetes in the plants, four to 500% increase in cancer and diabetes in the animal protein. Exact same amount of protein. It's not the protein that's causing it. It's the cholesterol, it's the saturated fat, it's the TMAO production, it's the microbiome dysbiosis, it's the methionine that's higher in that. It's all these other contributing factors. So let's stop blaming stuff on the protein. It's not the protein. This study showed it dramatically. It's not protein that's the problem. It's animal protein that's the problem. This is what's causing the health problems, not the protein levels, not the BCAA levels. BCAAs are necessary, are required. They're called essential amino acids because we can't live without them. <laughs> so why would, yes, too much of anything is not a good thing, but getting the proper amounts is very important, especially for maintaining strength health, and overall presence of maintaining that body composition where you have a higher amount of muscle tissue to your fat tissue so that your cellular metabolism functions well. That means not, a, not fat accumulating there. That all that dysbiosis that's going on inside the cells because of fat accumulation from plants, that's the problem. It is not the BCAs, it is not the protein. So let's get beyond this. Let's stop associating all of these things that are saying, oh, animal proteins, therefore all proteins cause these problems. They do not. Read it right there. That's right from the study. These associations were abolished if the proteins were plant derived, same exact level of protein, different outcomes. This is why we are talking about very specific where these proteins come from and what they're accompanied with. Let's stop making these gross associations that our, our associations are not good. Sexism, racism, these are associations. They're finding one bad person within that and then saying all person of that color, gender, whatever, uh, race, uh, ethnic preference, sexual preference, whatever. No, there's bad people within all groups. That doesn't make the entire group wrong or bad. Let's stop doing that. There's good essential fats. There's good essential amino acids. There are good proteins and bad proteins. Let's be clear about what we're talking about. Stop demonizing fats. Stop demonizing carbohydrates. And stop demonizing proteins. Let's be specific. It's the animal fats. It's the animal proteins. It's the lack of fiber in the animal diet that's causing these health problems. That's what I want to convey to you. I hope we get past this fear-based mentality 
that what we're seeing with an animal-based diet and overweight, uh, non-exercising people, your metabolism changes when you take on a plant-based diet, just like your metabolism changes when you start to exercise. We know that exercise and a plant-based lifestyle can reverse diabetes. 100% known. It is established in, in the medical community. And look, if I can go into my 60th year being in the best physical shape that I'm on, totally medication-free, no drug states, no disease states whatsoever, at, at almost 60 years of age, and taking branched chain amino acids every day for the last 25 years. Yes. So it, do you think that I'm causing a dysbiosis, too much fat gain, too much uh, diabetes, and muscle loss? When you do insulin resistance, your body can't produce protein as well, and you drop in muscle tissue. You gain in body fat. All that calories is going to fat storage instead of to usage to grow or build muscles because you're just not using them. Listen, guys, it's, it's simple mathematics. When you exercise, you put your demand for protein and calories and essential nutrients, higher demand because you're using that. And those make your cells healthier because you're basically exercising your cells at a cellular level too. This cellular health increases longevity, which you've got to give the body the nutrients it needs to, to properly function that way. That's why I go out and try to find these things to give your to help people get their body into optimal nutritional states so you can experience, you know, quicker, easier, um, uh, established metabolic health. And you could do that with the help of supplements. You can do it without it too as well. Exercise is key. Nutrition is key. You can't do it without either one of those, whether you get them from their foods or from the supplements. The reason why I look for foods, ahi flour, the richest source of omega-3 and omega-6 on the planet, period. Lentine, the richest source of micronutrients, richest source of essential amino acids on the planet of any plant. Why do I do this? Because right now in our modern age, we have people who are way out of whack. Doing a little bit of change is only going to help a little bit. And a lot of people will start to exercise or start on a diet and not see results fast enough. They'll give up and they'll walk away from it and go back to eating the garbage and stop exercising. And then they're going to end up dying from disease states. Many of them will. And that breaks my heart. I don't want to see you do that. So the reason why I do this is because we are so far away from a healthy state, I'm trying to get the absolute best that nature has to offer to bring that gap back together sooner, quicker, so that you can see results in the gym sooner, so that you can get excited about and motivated. Oh my God, this is great. I feel better. I look better. I'm going to keep exercising. I'm going to keep up with my nutrition. What can I do better now? Now I can eat more whole foods. Now I'm going to get more junk food out of my diet. I want to motivate people by giving them results sooner with highly nutrient sources of supplementation. So you can get that hypercompensation to try to bring yourself back to a healthy state as quickly as possible. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. And, and look, uh, just to be clear, uh, I'm not knocking on Dr. Greger. Dr. Greger has done amazing things for the community. I, <laughs> I bow down to Dr. Greger for his contributions for this movement, but he does have a serious bias against supplements. I don't know why, maybe he feels guilty about being a medical doctor and a doctor of medicine and medicine contributing to so many ill healths uh, in, in society that maybe that guilt is driving him to attack the, and say, you know, look at the negatives of the supplement industry. I, I can get that, I understand that, but I don't, I don't, I don't, fault him or anything, but I do want to set the record straight, especially when he's promoting, you know, um, different studies that are really directly misleading, saying that branch chains cause insulin resistance, when the study itself didn't even look at, didn't even um, account for branch chains at all. All it did was say, eat less of the animal foods, which we know contain fat, which we know causes insulin resistance. So that's called a confounding factor. And that's such a bleedingly obvious confounding factor that animal foods contain high fat. And when you reduce the animal foods, you're going to improve the metabolic health. But of course you are. <laughs> That's understood. 
but to to use a study with a directly and intentionally misleading title that branch chains are the cause of that when that study showed no proof whatsoever that branch chains directly caused that nor did it show any causality nor did it even show the method of action i showed you studies that actually drilled down to the mechanisms of action that it's actually just plasma bcas that are created by your own body when you are in a dysfunctional type two diabetic state, when you're not exercising. It's the exercise itself that clears those branch chains out, the plasma levels drop. The other studies I showed, showed that when you exercise, even taking more branch chains, the plasma levels didn't change at all, zero. So there's no association of branch chain amino acids with insulin response, none. Exactly those that were exercising and use branch chain improved their insulin sensitivity. They increased their insulin sensitivity and lowered body fat. So it's just silly to do that. It's, you know, and I won't go into it anymore because I think very highly of Dr. Greger. I'm really uh, proud of the, all the contributions he's done. This one, he just got totally wrong. And I, I really believe it's from his bias against supplements. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I'll be talking a lot about different nutritional aspects, but I did want to try to set the record straight on this because it's so important. It branch chains, especially for the elderly, could save lives and keep your body in a healthy, practical state. If you like this uh, video, share it, talk about it with friends. At least you have some more information and more of the studies that you can research yourself. You can see the mechanisms of action. You can see why it's branch chains, just like sugar, are not the cause of insulin response, insulin resistance, but it's actually the fat. And even Dr. Greger st states as much as a whole video about why uh, fat actually causes insulin resistance. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope you've got some great information out of it. Please share if you like it and talk to other people about it so we can set the record straight and stop some of this misinformation that has been spread around the community just because people are misunderstanding the studies based on their titles, not by understanding what the physiological effects that are really going on inside the human body. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next week.